So if you don't mind, let me say it like this. The track you just heard is an excerpt from my brand new album, Amor Fati. You may remember the music videos I put out last year, Blasphemy, Straight A's, and Forward. This new album features all three of those singles, plus seven brand new songs. Now I put my all into this project, and it's a real representation of my passion for music. So if you want to listen to the whole thing, click in the description, or search Cold X-Man on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you listen to music. Now back to the podcast. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today needs no introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist, author, and science communicator. He's the Frederick P. Rose Director of the Hayden Planetarium at the Rose Center for Earth and Space in New York City. He's also hosted and co-hosted numerous science-related TV and radio programs, including Nova Science Now and Cosmos, a space-time odyssey. Neil has written several books, including The Pluto Files, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry, and his new book, Starry Messenger. This is Neil's second time on the podcast, and this time we discuss many issues, including declining public trust in science. We talk about UFOs, or UAPs as they're now called. We discuss the history of scientific racism. We talk about the art of communicating science to the general public. We talk about the issue of cultural appropriation. We talk about the generational gap between Neil and myself and how that may lead us to interpret our experiences differently as black men in predominantly white intellectual spaces. And we talk about much more. So without further ado, Neil deGrasse Tyson. All right, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Hey. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. Yeah, good to see you again. again. So uh, last time we spoke, I think it was 2020. uh, So it's been... Uh, probably almost it's 20 years ago because yeah. COVID adds time. <laughs> it's like dog years. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So a lot has changed and um, it's really good to get you back on the show again. Mm-hmm. You released a book a few months ago called Starry Messenger where you tackled a lot of bigger and wider topics uh, than just physics or astrophysics. Um, and, and that was... I, th- I feel like that's a p- pretty landmark uh, event in, in your life, considering m- all your books prior had been more narrowly focused. So there's a lot of a, a lot of topics you've now dealt with that you hadn't really spoken too much about publicly, and we're going to get into some of those. I want to start by talking about science broadly. Mm-hmm. You you open that. By book, the way, uh, just to be clear, yeah, go ahead. The book and the breadth of topics. That it addresses is not me just jumping into spaces where where I don't belong. Mm. Uh, it's me taking the lens of science and observing civilization with mm. it. Mm. And since science is largely responsible for shaping civilization as we know it, um, this became quite a fertile exercise. Mm. And uh, reassessing, taking a fresh look at what people do, what people say, but from a scientific perspective, really, I think the metaphor of lens works very well here. You do whatever you do, now hold up a scientifically literate lens, and now what does it look like? And, and from, a, from afar, you know, people say, oh, what's the stratospheric view, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that has value when thinking about arguments or, or ideas, but you can go even higher than a stratospheric view. Yes, you can go to an orbital view, which gets you that overview effect that astronauts have spoken about, but you can even go farther. The overview effect, you're still kind of attached to the Earth there. You can go to a cosmic perspective, and everything looks different. So the book is an offering to the public in case they're interested in what it looks like to a scientist. So let's talk about what the scientific lens is. Mm -hmm. What makes the lens of science different, unique, more valuable relative to the lens of, say, gut intuitions um, and and other common lenses that we generally use to apply the world? Yeah, Uh, I'm not here so much to say that it's better. I'm going to say that it's different in a way that you might value. That's how I'd rather put it. 
I'm not going to sit here and rank lenses. Mm -hmm. uh, different lenses offer the individual and society and the world different features of what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. um, the irrational lens, let me not say irrational, let's say the, the uh, creative lens that is not bound to the laws of physics in any traditional sense, uh, can be responsible for some of our greatest works of art. So, no, I'm not going to value judge it. And so I will say that if you think you are making sense, however you want to think about that word, making sense, if you think you're making sense, if you think you've, if you think you've thought it through, the job of a scientist is to look at ideas, phenomena, objects in every possible angle before you draw a conclusion about mm -hmm. that thing. Mm -hmm. And if I don't look at it at every angle and I missed it, the whole point of a peer review is, oh, you missed that. You get a colleague points it out to you. It's their job to show where you messed up, okay, where you forgot to consider a factor where you didn't double check something that maybe should have been double checked, where you might have had some bias that leaked into your questions or your experiments or your conclusions. And so the, what distinguishes science is it aims to remove as far as possible, ideally remove completely, any possible bias you could have on your thoughts and conclusions that you draw from your observations of the world. So, the scientist, when brought into a conversation and hearing you make a statement about the world, they'll say, well, have you considered this? Or, well, what about that? And what happens if you reverse it? Then what, do you still think about it the same way? And it's a way to challenge what you might have imagined to be a fully thought out idea that you carry with you. Mm. And so that's science brought to society. Science in the lab, it's doing this every minute of every day at all times. It's not even a, it's, it's, we don't, it's so, it's so, it's ingrained in how you ask questions, how you conduct the experiments and how you draw conclusions that uh, I'm, I'm actually disappointed that the success of science is not sort of shared with the rest of civilization, the methods and tools. Oh my gosh. What do you mean by that? Oh, so what we do in the lab, how we think about the problem, is not, it's not really how it's taught in school. Mm -hmm. It's, well, here's a book, a science book, and there are words that are bold-faced, mm -hmm. and that's, those are your vocabulary words. You better memorize what those mean. And then you get an exam, and at the end, the science is a satchel of facts to you, not, not an understanding of how we query nature. That and the methods and tools required to be successful at that. I claim that if more people understood how and why science works, you could apply to other walks of life mm. and the world would be less error prone mm -hmm. than it has been certainly in recent decades. So what you're describing is science in theory. Uh, like most things, there's a distance between what it is in theory and what it is in practice in, in the no, flawed no, I just said, no, no, that's, human it's, world. It's right? not in theory, it's practice. In practice, we do all we can to not fool ourselves into thinking something is true that isn't or that something is not true that is. Did I say that right? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. All right. And so we do as much as is possible to accomplish that. And like I said, the peer review is a very important cog in that wheel. And occasionally something will still slip through that missed everybody's um, analysis. Mm -hmm. And so, so you don't know that until somebody else finds it, but that's how it works. I didn't describe anything in theory to you. I described exactly how it unfolds in practice. So I think 
there there's a problem with public trust in science having declined over the past few years. Yeah. Yeah. And I think and, we should and, examine well, the reasons deeper, for, public, the reasons for that. Public trust in institutions and in institutions well. in it's general. It's a d- deeper issue. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um one observation I've made is that uh science works excellently when the topic is not politicized. Um, so for, for instance, astrophysics, it's just not a red team, blue team, cable news. People aren't arguing about outside the flatter society. People aren't arguing <laughs> in, in the Republican Democrat sphere over physics facts or astrophysics facts. But when you had something like COVID, right, that quickly became a politicized topic and in my experience, the moment something becomes politicized, the quality of science and scientific communications in practice tends to suffer. So I'll give you one example that, um, that disturbed me during COVID. So the, this came out in the New York Times, I think, a little over a year ago when the CDC released data about the efficacy of the boosters, the first booster shot. And a spokesperson for the CDC admitted to, to the New York Times that they had all this data about efficacy of the booster between different age populations, but they only released it for older populations because that's where the data looked pretty impressive for the booster. For people my age, it didn't look so impressive, so they just didn't release that data, right? And so that comes out, and I'm, th- I'm shocked. By the thinking, way, release the data would mean making it public. Making it, it public. It surely already existed in journals that would not otherwise have access that the CDC doesn't control what gets published. They'll, they will, yeah, they will. Uh, yeah. What matters is, you know, we're all relying on these agencies to do the reading of the journals, right? Mm-hmm. So they can choose what they make public, right? right? All the cameras are there on them and whatnot, but, but so continue. Yeah. Anyway, mm-hmm. so the, and one of the reasons this CDC spokesperson cited is because they didn't want to give the impression that any aspect of the vaccine might not be useful to any aspect of the population. And this seemed to mm-hmm. me to be a, politis, a, a, polit, a a side effect of the politicization of the issue because we split into this pro-vax, anti-vax thing, which, which um, hijacked all of our political tribal impulses, right? Mm-hmm. So now if you're on one team, you don't want to give any perceived win to the other side, even if, um, you know— one aspect lends itself perhaps to that yeah, narrative. Yeah, that, that's right? fair. So the issue here is not the science. It's the conduit between the moving frontier of science mm-hmm. and people's access to what that means. Mm-hmm. And so that requires interlocutors. Yes. And some of whom are political appointees, others of whom, like you said, uh, don't want to look like they're carrying some kind of political bias Mm-hmm. And these are people with much less experience communicating science to the public than perhaps they should have, especially in those situations. So, um, yeah, they're, by the way, as sci- when you get degrees in science, only recently has there been any attention given to communicating science to the public as a professional scientist. There's a few organizations, um, in fact, Alan Alda spearheaded, the actor Alan Alda mm-hmm. spearheaded an entire school at Stony Brook, the State University of New York at Stony Brook on Long Island, that is committed to taking graduate students in the sciences as well as faculty and training them how to communicate with the public. Mm-hmm. And because it was not previously, it was an unvalued feature of what it is to be, uh, you know, what, what do you do? You go to the lab and you work your, you know, 15 hours a day and that's, they, they pat you on the back for that. And whether or not you can communicate it was irrelevant. So, so it matters. Now. If you, if you had 30 seconds or a minute to tell scientists, give them some, the most important wise lessons about how to communicate to the public in 30 seconds. For a minute. <laughs> um, 
it, it's, it comes at a cost of their productivity. You have to spend time learning how people think, what they care about, what they do. Here's an example. I got an award, I think it was National Science Teachers Association or an organization like that. I got mm -hmm. an award um, and I, I gave a little acceptance speech. And I asked people, I said, this is back now in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So I said, these are, so these are all science teachers, not mm -hmm. only high school, but community college and, and colleges, mm -hmm. okay? Not so much the research scientists, but the teaching faculty. And I said, how many of you do not own a television? Half the hands went up. Half. Half. Wow. I said, of those who own a television, how many um, use it just for playing, uh, you know, just for uh, DVDs, right? Just, you know, you rent a movie and you play it. So it's a screen to watch a, to watch a DVD. Back when DVDs were still in. DVD, do you remember DVDs? Yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> and half the hands, okay, went up. So what, who's left here? So some, by the time I started slicing this, this Venn diagram, uh, about 15% of the audience actively watched any number of hours of TV in a week. Hmm. Four, was it? Okay. At that time, the average person in society watched 30 hours of TV a week. Mm -hmm. I said, how could you possibly claim that you know and understand who you're teaching? Mm -hmm. You have no idea of the influences of what's going on in the mind of the person who you're trying to teach physics to. Mm -hmm. Like, what? And so I challenged them to, at least metaphorically, stop facing the chalkboard and not looking at the audience. Okay? Occasionally turn around and move at least halfway to them. All right? I professionally as an educator, I try to reach them, I try to make, I try to gap 90% of the distance to the mental pathways of who I'm communicating with. Mm -hmm. Minimizing what is their effort to learn what it is I'm trying to tell them. And so, yeah, in order for me to be pop culture fluent, I'm spending a time, spending time becoming pop culture fluent, which means I'm not in the lab publishing my next research paper, which is the currency of tenure and respect in the field. And all these things we are trained to want as you ascend the ranks mm -hmm. uh, in graduate school and into postdoc, assistant associate and full professor uh, elevations. So, so yeah, my, my one minute pitch is in order to be a better communicator, I think, you're gonna to have to give up some of the time you would have spent in the lab. Mm -hmm. And if they don't wanna do that, then yeah, it comes back and bites you in the ass. You have people trying to communicate the value of science to the public and they're, they're bungling the task. And that's unfortunate. And I think, yes, that has, I don't think that's the entire reason for the collapse of trust in institutions, but it's a factor for sure. Mm. Okay, so I want to talk to you about unidentified um, flying objects. Sure. Uh, now called unidentified aerial phenomena. Rebranded. Rebranded. Yeah, who are they fooling? They're not yeah. fooling anybody. No, they're they, not. They, they mean UFOs, right? Okay. So they, that is the U.S. government. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of years ago, if you were into UFOs, a lot of people would view you as a tinfoil hat crowd conspiracy wacko. But just to be clear, um, in the 1960s, the Air Force had Project Blue Book, which was completely conceived and designed to investigate sightings of UFOs. It was a government and was a report published at the end and mm -hmm. all the like. It's not the first time the government has invested money, time and energy thinking about this problem. So, and of course, there's no shortage of films portraying it. So, so the accurate, uh, the, the, ac 
the search for data, data, images, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, is an, has been an ongoing thing, you know, since the 40s. So, so I, I, don't know that it, I don't know that it was more of a tinfoil hat thing recently than it had ever been, mm -hmm. nor do I think the government ever thought of it as, let me, let me separate the variables here, mm -hmm. okay? There are objects in the sky that occasionally we don't know what they are. They're unidentified, so they're UFOs. Fine. I'd want the government to investigate them. If something's flying over my head, especially go back to the Cold War, where you don't know what the, quote, enemy is doing um, over our airspace, especially when Sputnik got launched, okay? Uh, and it's flying over our head without our consent. You can't fly in our airspace without our consent. But when you're in space space, there is no treaty governing at the time mm -hmm. who can fly over what country. In fact, they can't maneuver. It's just an orbital path. So my point is, I'd want them to look at it. The tinfoil hat part of it is not that you're seeing glowing objects in the sky that you can't identify. The tinfoil hat is the entire community of people that are sure that aliens are visiting. You have conflated those two, and they're fine, as many people do, but they're separable variables here, and they should be kept separate. So my, my question is more... Um, a couple years ago, you could have reasonably assumed that all those videos of, you know, strange objects going through the air and suddenly tilting. Sure. You know, so you could have assumed, well, I'm sure the government has some secret explanation. I'm sure they know what that was. Maybe it was one of our aircraft. I don't know why anyone has that much confidence in the U.S. government knowing anything. Well, no, I th this, this, a reasonable this, this, person <laughs> could have believed that there was some, because we have state secrets, et cetera, right? But now what I'm saying is has changed in the just, past few years. Just to be years. clear, um, yeah, there's state secrets. Usually the ones that are best kept are the ones no one cares about knowing. Just keep that maybe, in mind. Maybe, maybe so. Look at what we knew about President Clinton's genitals on national television. If there were, any, if there were ever going to be a state secret, it might have been that. So I don't, mm -hmm. I have no confidence in the competence of the government to pull off anything remotely resembling the level of secrecy that people are, are crediting it with accomplishing. But I just have okay. to slip that in there. So, continue, so I interrupted you. Go on. So um, in, in any sense, it seemed to me significant, maybe, maybe less to you, but it seemed to me significant when you had government officials in Congress saying, actually... We know that these are indeed um, objects. They're not the camera, camera malfunctioning. They're not American military uh, aircrafts. Uh, we're pretty sure they're not Chinese or Russian, and we don't know what they are. Sure. So that seemed to me significant in terms of closing the door to a lot of potential explanations of what these videos were. You're um, trusting that the government gave correct answers to that. They I'm gave assuming, the best available. I mean, right. I'm so you, I don't trust that. I, I, no, it's not a matter of trust. I think the government is way less competent than people are crediting it with being in those situations. But let's assume, fine. They say it's not us. We don't. And they, in the end, it's the they give the list of what it's not, and then they say we don't know what it is. Right, but sh surely Boom, then, there's the U in yeah. UFO. Yes, Boom. we're done that's with that conversation. It doesn't automatically mean it's anything when you just said you don't know what it is. Right. So what I'm saying is like, I'm completely incompetent as some random idiot with a laptop, right? So when someone that probably has much more access to information from the military says, also, we don't know what it is, that was that was significant to me because it, it uh, I, I assumed it may not have been a mystery in the past, but it really is, is a mystery. So... Um, I'm just curious, as someone that, you know, I'm sure you thought a lot about uh, the Fermi paradox and about, I know you thought a lot about the potential of extraterrestrial life and, and sure. all of that. Oh, yeah. Um, do you, and very likely out there in the universe. If you look at the numbers and, the, and the, the biology and the chemistry and the physics of the universe, you know, you, you'd have to be inexcusably egocentric to presume we're alone mm -hmm. in the universe. For mm -hmm. sure. So what probability do you assign, if, if at all? Or how do you think about Near the possibility that these 
UAPs have something to do with extraterrestrial Near life? zero. Near zero. How yeah. come? Because you have to ask other sets of questions. Okay. Uh, a point I've made in multiple platforms. Um, look at the images we're obtaining from the edge of the universe in a telescope parked a million miles from Earth, the James Webb Space Telescope, the high-resolution images of stars being born in gas clouds nearby and galaxies forming in the early universe. Look at the satellite photos we have of practically every square inch of Earth's surface. Look at the fact that one million people in any moment are airborne with a window and a high-resolution camera and video in their pocket. Look at the fact that there's six billion smartphones in the world. We're basically crowdsourcing any possible alien invasion. Because when I grew up, to have a camera on your body was a rare thing. What if it's not an alien invasion, but like a, sing Anything. a single unmanned probe? Sure. Like we might send to Mars, the Mars rover. I'm just saying right? we, um, sure. And all I'm saying is if your best image of an invading alien, excuse me, invisiting alien is a monochromatic fuzzy tic-tac in restricted naval airspace taken by a fighter pilot, that's your best data? Uh, we have to do better. Really. We have to, and, and it's doing some things you don't understand? You have to do better than that to convince someone that we're being visited by aliens. To, excuse me, to convince a, a, a skeptic, a genuine skeptic, not a, there are crazy skeptics out there that, that are, don't believe anything, okay? And, and that's, that's not what a true skeptic is. A true skeptic is, okay, that's interesting. Have you thought about this? Have you considered that? What about this? Okay? And a, an authentic skeptic ultimately lands at a conclusion supported by data. And they don't land at an conclusion that requires that they fill the gap in data with something that they want to be true, which is the foundation of conspiracy theorists. The foundation of all conspiracy theorists is there's a point where they're missing data. And in order to continue to believe what they want to be true, they gap that, uh, they gap it with a declaration that the thing that would be completely convincing is being withheld from them. So okay. what, what do you That's sign? That's not an authentic investigation. What do you, do you feel that? is a, a likelier explanation of? I don't know. I don't have to have an answer for everything. Science is not about always having answers. It's about when you don't know something, let's try to devise experiments to figure it out. We can sit here and speculate, I suppose, but that's not, what you do is you say, if I think it's aliens, what else would be true if it were aliens? It seems to me we'd have a better image of it than a monarch command because everybody's got a smartphone. If aliens landed anywhere, hovered anywhere, if they sh the mothership showed up, all the stuff that, our that stokes our imagination in sci-fi films, we'd have high-resolution images of it. But what and if by the way, in all the sci-fi films— What if it's just like a, a super high-tech probe that they sent to take some measures of an airspace, and then there's no alien, there's no— Yeah, you know, if we not, We wouldn't necessarily have all this other stuff, right? If you can't show that it's a probe, that's not my first thought. If you can't show— that it's an alien probe, or it's a, not my first explanation for it. What what would be first? I don't have a. Uh, so this is it's this, just not my first. It would be close to my last. I, it wouldn't be my first either. I mean, all my first would be that it's, you know, man made, here on Earth, and the the uh, the fact that or those it's an have optical been, effect. That there, you know, there's oh, a, yeah. there's a hundred things. No, but, that, but the be. fact that the the government and the military has has ruled those out. Not that they are infallible. I agree. The right. government's fairly right. incompetent. Mm -hmm. Um, but the fact that people who are scientifically rigorous and have access to high tech have ruled those out 
seems significant to me. Um, so I, I don't know that I would so put it. So it's a mystery. I don't know that I put it C- in your zero. Can't you live with a mystery? Sure, sure. Yeah, but but in I, I don't, I don't know have if, to have an answer to everything. I'm not saying that an I don't have an answer to. I, mean, I don't think I, I don't know if I would put it near zero. No, would you? What would the probability oh, what would that you put is? It at? Would you I don't put know. It at? Give me a number. Any I don't number. Know, five or ten. Five or ten. Yeah. Okay. So um, that could mean if I take liberties with the statistic, that one out of 10 of them is an authentic visiting alien. Uh, one out of 10 of the unexplained phenomenon. If you think there's a 10% chance. That, that's, I'm playing loose with the statistics, but that's yeah. kind of what you, that's the consequence. There's a 10% chance that's That we're alien. living in a world where... Aliens have visited. I'm thinking there'd be other more compelling evidence. Or have sent a, a light in the sent sky. Sent a drone. That, that have that sent a drone. I'm thinking there'd be more compelling evidence yeah. than an unresolved light in the sky that you cannot, whose behavior you cannot explain. I'm just thinking there'd be, uh, it's, it's, it's easier for me to think that there's some other atmospheric phenomenon that's not well understood mm-hmm. that's making it, for example. That put that as a much higher. Okay. Some other thing we don't understand that remains to be fully described. The universe brims with mysteries. Embrace that. And so, and like a point I've made on Twitter, I, uh, I said, it seems to me if aliens are coming, we would not need congressional hearings to establish that fact. People would have it on their smartphones and it would already be viral. Kittens go viral, jumping from table to chair. You know a high resolution image of a mothership out, floating outside of an airplane uh, is have you ever have you seen the crossing of airplanes on <clears throat> Earth's surface in a twenty four hour period? Have you seen the map? Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I think all all it's, this it's, stuff it's, is, it's a complete uh, these are coverage. You're imagining like grand Earth. scenarios from sci fi movies. I, I've never imagined that. I've only imagined the the narrowest case, which is like a drone, an unmanned drone that kind of like goes to planets and take some broad measurements because some alien scientists from a civilization alone. Why would it only show up in restricted naval airspace and not to anyone else's smartphone? That's a question I have not had an answer to. Uh, They're only showing up for the military, really? It may have only happened very few times. Maybe, maybe, you know, less than three times. Sure, and there are 8 billion people in the world. I'm thinking somebody would have caught it. That's all. It's six billion of them with smartphones. I'm just thinking somebody would have caught it. Unclear. I have a higher standard of required evidence in support of an extraordinary claim than perhaps many of the alien enthusiasts in the UFO world. Mm-hmm. So one of the m- craziest newspaper headlines was. UF, the government admits UFOs are real. It's like, what? That sentence makes no sense. It makes no sense. Unless you've completely conflated the fact that here's something you don't know what it is. Let's figure it out. Oh, you don't know what it is. Therefore, it's visiting aliens. So I'm disappointed with the reporting on this. It's, it's, well, couldn't that just mean it's not a, 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 a camera flicker, which a lot of people thought these were just camera malfunctions? So to say it is a flying object that's unidentified. Sure, admits, they all are. It admits something. They all are. Yes, I don't have a problem with that. Well, yeah, I wasn't sure of that, though. Right, Many oh, people weren't well, sure so of that. Some fraction of them would are, surely are camera be malfunctions. interior reflections in the camera. Yeah. Or, you know, and I've seen it. I've done photography my entire life. Right. So there's certain phenomena that goes on inside a camera that newbies to that would not know. Mm-hmm. And they think, well, I just, just like that's right. ghosts, people who like photographing ghosts. Mm-hmm. There are reflections inside of a camera that will easily give you um, uh, most, if not all, of what they're claiming as evidence for it. Mm. Uh, and uh, and if there's some something else that shows up in a camera that their eyes don't see, that's funny. Maybe there are ghosts. Um, you know, try to capture one one time, like the Ghostbusters, <laughs> and then release them. <laughs> I, mean, I just I I just have higher thresholds of acceptance for a claim mm-hmm. than what's going on. And by the way. I, I'm I'm not weirdly uh, 
if you look at how scientists address other scientists' data, it is the same standards that we're applying to each other for much less extraordinary things. Someone says, I found this planet orbiting this star at this rate. Well, how do you know it's that rate? Uh, because it could be a different rate. Did you correct? I'm, I'm analyzing it on a level where, and it has nothing to do with aliens. My, my point is, this level of attention given to um, you know, as the saying goes, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. We often require extraordinary evidence even for, not, for a non-extraordinary claim. And you don't see that because it happens in the coffee lounges and the mm -hmm. conferences and in the, uh, the peer reviews of scientific journals. And so I'm applying that same standard to these claims. I'm, it's, there's nothing different about what I'm doing here. And uh, I just need better data. G give me a high resolution image. Mm -hmm. of the alien walking towards you, of the mothership, where you can see things that are not just a flash. Like I said, it'd be, it'd be unlikely, though, that they would come physically, right? Like, so, like, we're, we're, we're intelligent life. We send probes so we say. Uh, out to, <laughs> you know, we send the Mars rover out there, et yeah. cetera. You, you, you say that it's, e it's egoistic to assume we're the only ones in the universe. Presumably, intelligent life would m may be similar to us in having curiosity and insofar sure, and as one of them was landed to, to say to say uh, and, and smart martian smartphones could take pictures of our rovers they could and they can yeah. go viral in the martian internet right and there you have it there it right. is right but i mean if we had just sent one that was if that it was, lands, that, that was in a very walk up to it very high la if airspace it lands they can walk up to it Right, if but what, what if it doesn't land and it's just it's it's up in high airspace? Then they have and then insufficient it, data, yeah, to demonstrate that it was an alien hour. Alien, they have insufficient data. It could be that, but if the no, data are insufficient, I don't think it's crazy. Now, that's um, all. That's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm not saying they're not aliens. I'm saying I need better evidence to support that contention. Fair that's enough. really what I'm saying. Okay, let's pivot to. Um, to artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. I assume that you've been paying attention to the developments that have been happening in the past, let's say, for, let's say, six to nine months with regard to... I've been paying attention over the last 50 years. 50 years. Yes. Okay. Um, I didn't mean to say only the last okay. nine months, obviously. <laughs> um, the latest salvo in yes, the AI yes. assault. Uh, I'm speaking existence. of chat GPT... In the realm of text, I'm talking about Mid Journey and Dolly 2 in the realm of image generation. More recently, Music LM in the realm of music generation, which is, in my view, quite a bit far behind the others, but I don't, I think we'll catch up quite mm -hmm. soon. Um, what do you make of these technologies? Do you, I mean, there, I think one of the big debates right now is to what degree they represent true intelligence. Uh, I, Noam Chomsky just released a New York Times article where he argues that chat GPT is not a true um, intelligence and there's all kinds of things humans can do that it can't. Frankly, I found that to be a weak argument because someone went and just asked chat GPT all the kinds of things that Chomsky said it couldn't answer and it, it answered them pretty handily. Um, in any event, where do you stand on this? What do you think? Do you think ChatGPT represents a uh, true artificial intelligence, or do you think it's just a glorified kind of copy paste machine? First of all, I don't ever take stances on things. This You've never not, taken a stance on anything. Not in the not in the way you're using the term. No. Okay. People take uh, this is what I do, and I'm going to defend. That is not me. That is, uh, a stance is a point of view that you will defend to death, right? No matter who's coming at you. And typically to take a stance is to be blind to arguments that might unravel the stance you're taking, but it won't unravel it because you're taking a stance. The very statement, a stance, is means you're digging your heels in. But if you're open to anything, you can't ever possibly take a stance. You're just offering information, receiving information with the power, should I call it that, to change your view 
at any moment based on new information that can come. Mm -hmm. So no, I don't have a stance on anything. I have a, I have, I can share an observation with you about it. Um, I think people are needlessly distracted by the definitions of words. Is it really intelligence? Is it really this? Is it really that? Is it, who cares? I don't, why even care? Does it get a task done that you'd rather not have spent time doing? Great. Let it happen. Let me go back to 1975. That year, between 74 and 76, was the transition from four function calculators going from $200 down to the price of a textbook, $40, $30, around there, which meant it then became accessible to a school system. Mm. And in the face of that, do you still teach long division? Do you, well, maybe so, because not everyone would have a calculator, even though they were as cheap as $40. And even if you did own one, it wasn't on your body. Everybody has a calculator now, at all times, 24 seven. So, certain things you no longer have to remember to do. Yeah, I like calculating a tip after dinner without pulling out a calculator. But you have a calculator. You can get a precise tip if you want it, mm -hmm. okay? The calculator replaced an entire category of mental tasks that we used to have to do and memorize. Mm -hmm. The times table, for goodness sake, you know. So, is someone saying, oh my gosh, this artificial intelligence, is this? No, it's a task that is replacing things that otherwise occupied our time. So and we're now using that time to do other things. What happens I, when the task I, is writing a full book? I, who cares? If it's a book, if it's an instruction manual on something, I don't want to write the damn manual. Let it write the manual. Boom. And it writes it in 20 minutes. I do some error checking on it and put it out there. What, what, I'll, what I'll if be, the task find me, is a... Uh... Find me in the Bahamas soaking in sun rather than writing that instruction manual. Mm hmm so, so, so personally, I don't see it as fundamentally different from every encroachment of science and technology on tasks that were previously conducted by humans. From machines, machine labor replacing human labor, robots build your cars. Today. Can I offer one reason why it seems different to me or seems more significant? Other than that you're living in it now? Go on. Yes. Um, I think— Because it's closer to you. Yeah. These other well, that, things are very distant. That's one reason. I, built into your understanding of the world. The rest of this is new to you. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you that when robots came in and built cars, and they built cars better than assembly line of humans did, by the way, there was a day when there was a finite chance, a real chance, that in the morning your car would not start. A very uh -huh. real chance. See, you're looking at me like, Wait, what? what Yes, yes, and you wouldn't know why. There would be some reason. The starter would be wrong. There was I feel like I, I was old. I'm old enough to remember that. Era. Okay, and that's know. even in movies. They'll show a car, they, they escape, and they can't start the car. Yeah. And, and anyone today is like, what? Why won't the car start? Is it out of gas? No, there's something else going on there. Robots made the cars. They all work. And they I, all see, work. I see what you mean. Okay, so, yeah. and a whole category of jobs went out the window because of that. All right. And you keep going. Oh, what happens? Oh, um, we have this game called chess. Oh, now the computer beats us. Mm -hmm. All right. Did the world end? No, it didn't. Fine. I'm glad it beat us in chess. Okay. And, and for me, the real transition there was when it beat us in Jeopardy. Mm. That's cultural information, right? Mm -hmm. But, oh, that information has to be on the internet. It has to be on the internet in order for the AI to know it mm -hmm. okay it can't be something that didn't land on the internet we're kind of putting everything on the internet so that's a moot point but it remains a fact i think so, right. so 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 did the world come to an end no all right let's keep going we got something that can fully write someone's essay in college okay so that would be cheating um all right uh, there are other ways to cheat uh i could bring a book into a closed book exam. That would be cheating. 
So uh, we have rules against that. Yeah, so I, the, the, the one reason that I, it seems to me especially significant is because uh, I think many people felt that artistic creativity was maybe the one human thing that the machines could never do. That maybe you could be better than me at math. Maybe you could be even better at a fairly calculating game like chess, but you will never write a symphony like Beethoven. You'll never write a play like Shakespeare, right? People felt this way, rightly or wrongly, I think. Yeah, I never felt that way. You never felt that I, way? I thought it was in inevitable, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, but well, that doesn't enough. mean it's now it's intelligent when previously it wasn't. The fact that computers fly airplanes, the, the pilot is practically in the cockpit just for show, okay? Uh, computers fly and stabilize airplanes. And, and so I guess in the tech world, in the scientific world, it has been replacing our brain labor ever since we've had access to them. And we've done that on purpose. Mm -hmm. it, we didn't fear this. We sought it out so that our brains could be devoted to other things. Okay. So um, now it, it touches the arts. So welcome, right. other, to, other things welcome like to the club. And now the Welcome to so, the club. So what's going to be left? 50 years from now, what's going to be left for us to devote our time? Are we all just going to be like sitting on the beach as AI creates all the wealth and content in the world because it's better than us at everything? Why not? I would, I would, if I were to say that there's a limit to AI, and I'm happy to be shown to be wrong on this, which is why it's not a stance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, I can think something up that no one has thought before, mm -hmm. or more, more precisely, I can have, think up an idea that does not currently exist on the internet and develop it and build something based on it. I don't see how AI would have access to that. Hmm. So can AI, that's why you said it can write like you, Shakespeare. You, you played Shakespeare around with already exists. If there were no Shakespeare, could you tell AI to be Shakespeare? I don't I think so. so because it's, it's basing its creativity on human creativity that predates it, that preexisted, and that exists I on the I internet. would argue that very creative people often subconsciously are creating based on combinations and permutations of things they've consumed. Of course, all the time. Right. So here's the thing. If you, if you ask ChatGPT, obviously, it won't come up with something brand new. But if you say, combine Shakespeare's style with you know, something else really different, and it does that, it may, it may end up creating something that really seems novel, even though it's a combination of two other things. Sure. And, but, and a lot of creativity is like that. Yeah. Um, there, I would say Einstein's general theory of relativity uh, is not based on anything that came before it. It is invented out of whole cloth out of his head. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, so I, I don't know how good AI can ever be at inventing something that doesn't otherwise exist. Yes, you, you can tell it that, but is it going to do it on its own? Is it... Is it whole cloth, though? Is Einstein whole cloth? No, no, or no. Is no it, not as special it, um, relativity, general relativity, just to uh -huh. I have to be precise there. Okay. Um, or, or is The curvature it, of space-time in the presence of gravity, mm -hmm. that, was, that came out of nowhere. Mm. That that was, that I'm sorry, it came out of his head. Yeah, but I don't see that as having been derived from some other person. So work. you do think there is there is that's the frontier between human and and machine is that machines will never be able to be truly creative, come up with truly new ideas. If I were to put a line in the sand, uh, I would say that's where it is. Yeah, uh, and and again, it can only be creative based on priors that exist, that it has access to on the internet. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, relevant to that, 
related to it is if I upload my consciousness, which people would love talking about, uh, you upload your consciousness to some box. And then it's, well, is that you? You ask it questions and it'll give you all the answers you would have given because it has all your neurosynaptic um, connections. All right. In that moment, I go to the Bahamas and I meet new people and I taste new foods and I, then I come back. I have a life experience that that no longer does. Mm -hmm. So me, my life has split at that point between the consciousness up to 10 days ago and my consciousness that now has a 10 day vacation in the Bahamas that have met new people. And none you, of that's you met uh, Sam Bankman Fried and joined <laughs> his polycule <laughs> in the Bahamas. So there's no, um, uh, and I didn't put that on the internet. So uh -huh. we cannot deduce my new experiences. And from those experiences, I have an idea. I'm going to write a short story based on that. It can't write that short story because it doesn't have that experience that I have now layered on top of my entire consciousness that was uploaded 10 days ago. Mm -hmm. So I still think there's room to be creative, but look at how much stuff we have to write that is not creative. You know, wiki pages are not creative. They're just informational. Let, let, let a bot do that. Uh, and don't be upset by it. Find something else to do that it can't. My suspicion is that there's actually nothing humans can do that machines won't be able to, including that truly novel idea generation. My suspicion is that as they get more powerful, the ideas they come up with will increasingly approach and ultimately reach that level of like true novelty. That's my suspicion. I can't really justify right, let's it. Let's go back to 18, than, when was it? 30, 1840. Mm -hmm. Could AI have invented the process of photography? I, I don't think so. AI doesn't build things. It just has ideas, right? Um, I do something inventive in my home that solves a problem, okay? Is AI gonna do that? I, I, I don't know. Maybe, but if it does, I think that's very last, very late in the AI development. Uh, if, yeah, you're right. Artificial intelligence, it imitates us in some way. But again, it's internet-based. I mean, think about that. It can only do what it has access to be able to do. You can't do things that a human, that, unless the, the AI, AI makes bots that go on vacations to the beach, all right? And then they experience what I would experience. Okay. I don't see that anytime soon. Plus, AI is not really in the direction of making humanoid robots. That's how everyone has thought about it. But, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I don't think the, I don't think the economic drivers will send it in that direction. Of the humanoid robot correct, direction. Correct, correct. Because it won't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Why would yeah. you need that? Right. Um, you know, older things, they, they, uh, you know, if you look at the Jetsons, all right, uh, there was a maid robot who wore a little maid outfit, and the maid did the laundry. But why? I mean, what, like, what do you do? So, in other words, I see AI... Yes, replacing tasks one by one. Mm -hmm. But I don't see one thing doing everything. I don't, what's the point of that? Why would someone do that? Okay. I don't need my car that drives me to my work, which is its own version of AI because it's no human intervention and it is following all traffic signals and calculating the best route based on what the traffic is, right? Uh, people are... That already exists with us, so no one's thinking of that as AI. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. If you show that to someone in the 1970s, they say, oh, there it is. That's AI. Mm -hmm. It's making decisions for you. Mm -hmm. it, it knows your name. Mm -hmm. It can, okay. So as we move forward, everyone is pocketing what would have previously been considered amazing achievements of AI. It's like, we're not I there agree. yet. I agree. And so uh, that's evidence that we're just absorbing the things that are changing in society. Mm -hmm. And... I think that'll just continue. And yes, we have to readjust the workplace to make this happen. 
because a lot of people will be out of jobs, especially drivers. There's some, I read some number and I didn't believe it and then I ran some numbers on it. It's something like, what is it, 40%? Some, some high number, 30% of all men are employed in a driving or are employed in a driving capacity. I think it, there's about a million truckers alone yeah. in, so in you, America. So it's truckers, taxis, car services, forklifts, yeah. um, include bus drivers mm -hmm. and uh, train conductors, mm -hmm. you know, folks like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And by the way, you're born into an era, I'm mean, older than you, where you're not wondering where's the conductor when you're taking the tram between terminals mm -hmm. at an airport. Mm -hmm. That's, oh, but, oh, that's not AI? It knows when to come, when to stop, when to open the doors. It tells you the doors are about to open. It knows when to leave. All that's happening and no people are involved. Okay? Oh, my gosh. There was a day when there would have been a person there. They've been replaced by a machine plus some computing. So, 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 I, so I don't, well, fear, I don't the, fear this uh -huh. going forward. And one point about kids cheating on essays you know why people cheat? They cheat because schools value grades more than students value learning. If that were not the case, no one would ever cheat, ever. It would never even be a thought. You wouldn't have to take an oath. You wouldn't have to promise. No, it would just be, I wanna learn. I'm here to learn. I wanna learn. No, you have to get the high grade. Oh, now I got to cheat so I can get the high grade. So schools will have to shift in what they're, how they emphasize what they're doing with students so that no one even wants to cheat because they'll value what they learn. And if you value what you learn, you will never have ChatGBT write your essay. So how do, you, uh, how do you ask? Act. So you're not recommending to get rid of grades entirely. I am passing judgment on the weight given to grades mm -hmm. for people in school. You can test someone and say, oh, you need to do better. Let's do better. Mm -hmm. And you test them again, you test them again, and now they've learned it. Mm -hmm. And now we're good. You've learned it. No grades. The grades are tools, not imprimaturs. On so how, the, how do you incentivize? The, we all get branded um, by the grades. I was an A student. I've heard people say, you know, I should know that. I got an A in that class. <laughs> that very sentence itself is absurd because they're using their grade as their measure of what they should know rather than knowing the thing that they should know. If I put myself, though, back into what they should have my, said is, my shoes. I took a class on this. I know it. Not I got an A in the class. Therefore, I should know it. How come I don't remember it? Yeah. If I put myself back in my high school shoes in a class that maybe I wasn't so interested in, like maybe, I don't know, some class that was not my favorite. To me, the incentive to do any work really was I don't want to get a bad grade. Whereas the classes I really loved, I didn't really need that incentive. But I was also probably in the higher percentile of like interested in, for its own sake kind of a kid, especially in science and like philosophy, for example. The but great, like, the let's great say teachers, your average, I, I have an answer for you. Yeah. The great teachers on any campus, mm -hmm. everyone knows who they are. Mm -hmm. There's all the buzz of who it is. And sometimes there's a separate document or a web page given to the best, but, you know, unofficial, you know, the, the university would never sanction it, of course. So you all know who the best teachers are. Often you are told what class to take. You are, you are, it is recommended you take the class because it's so great. And you know something? They can make you interested even if you were not interested going in at the beginning. So it is a failure of the professor for you to say, I'm not really interested in this class anyway. I have to take it. I just need a good grade. But, you but, know, 50% of teachers are below average. So what do you do? What do you do with? On average. They're below average. <laughs> on, on average, 50% are below average. No, but Although there are thresholds. Sure, no, I'm not talking about what's average here. I'm talking about threshold of engagement. There are teachers who have the power to make their subject the most interesting thing you've ever heard of and done while you're in their class. You know them. These teachers exist. Yep. Okay? Make every teacher that way. And then they can all be above average. <laughs>
because it's a threshold. Well, you know they point. can't. It's a threat. Well, no, can't it's a threshold. They can all be above a certain threshold. Yes, you're saying. And then you can spread them of who's better at that. Uh huh. Fine. Uh huh. But the minimum requirement is, if I'm not interested in your subject, and you teach me the subject, and I'm even less interested in it, or I'm the same, get a different teacher. Well, this goes back to what your superpower is and has been throughout your career, which is as you said in the beginning, bridging that gap. I think I would call it cognitive empathy, bridging the gap between sure. what you know and what you know is in the minds of a classroom of either dis, possibly disinterested students initially. It's like, See, how do you bridge that gap? I would call it getting to know your audience. You can call it cognitive empathy. Uh -huh. <laughs> because, <laughs> um, okay. Those two words together are less transparent than getting to know your audience. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. the fact that you felt the urge to rebrand it with— That's how it's branded in my mind to be— I wasn't oh, no, no, trying to make uh, it sound like— What I'm saying is, for you to say, today we're going to go over cognitive empathy. It's like, what? The fuck? Today, I want to learn how you're thinking. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, that's an example of putting a distance between you and your audience. Mm-hmm. The fact that you wanted to call it something. I didn't want to call it that. You, that's but just, you did. No, you but that's, did. Just, but that's just what it is in my mind. I get it. Right. I get it. Yeah. I, but I if I, and I respect that. But don't think that that makes it, don't think that calling it that is a step forward in having people understand what you're talking about. It's a step back. No, backwards. no, I don't, I don't think it is. I mean, okay. I, I just, I call things what it occurs to me to call them. This is why I'm not as good at, an educator as you, <laughs> you know, you have to realize, saying. no, no, you have to realize you are one of the greatest of all time at this skill. Okay. I, the reason why I don't you know think about it that way, thank you, but you I don't are, think about right? it that way because I am dealing with really good material, black holes, quite, you know, the edge of the universe. Yeah, but, I got a, I got a, the but, first, but, the Hubble and now the James Webb telescope. All astrophysicists have that same source material to communicate, right? Yes, we do. And I would and say it is on, awesome, on average, we are more out there than many other professions are that have many more members in their groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's got to be a hundred times as many, no, probably a thousand times as many engineers in the world as there are astrophysicists. Mm -hmm. JWST is an engineering marvel. How come people don't want to learn about the engineering? Can you name an engineer who has a household name? I don't think so. Yet you, go, but going through the decades, you can name highly visible scientists, and many of them. In fact, I would say most of them have been. They got famous for the astrophysics part of what they've done. Stephen Hawking is a physicist. Mm -hmm. People got to know him because he wrote a book on the universe, mm -hmm. not specifically on the laws of physics and the physics he worked on, but brief history of time is the. That's where he went. That's how he got known. Carl Sagan. Mm -hmm. um, you can keep doing Albert Einstein. Of course, he did great things in many areas. Um, uh, so, if you look at so you're saying something YouTube, is if you look at YouTube, uh, not YouTube, just mm -hmm. general uh, social media influencers mm -hmm. who have platforms in science, and look at their followings. Those who do astronomy-related topics have higher followings than everybody else. That's a good point. So we naturally find something yes. more fascinating about astrophysics and yes. than chemistry, say. I think so. Yeah. I, 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 and why is that? Because we all look up and wonder mm -hmm. and ponder our existence in this world. Plus, looking up, you know, most gods are up above us mm -hmm. in the sky, in the clouds, on mountains, and... So I think that deep sense of curiosity, and let me take an evolutionary leap and declare that, you know, humans among mammals are one of the few species that are perfectly comfortable sleeping on our back. Think about it. I'm more of a side sleeper. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're on your back, you don't say, oh, this is awful. Let me turn over. You're okay on your back. And we sleep at night. Mm -hmm. If you ever wake up at night on your back, you're looking up. Mm -hmm. 
Has a beetle ever seen the night sky? Beetles don't like going on their back, right? <laughs> um, its legs just flail. <laughs> uh, turtles, you know? Uh, I, so it may be that we evolved to sustain some curiosity. Hmm. Like, you know, oh, what is that star over there? Well, the moon was here, but now it's there. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's, I think it happened natively within our evolutionary past. But anyhow, that's, I'm, I'm overstepping there. It's just no, it's fun I, to I imagine that's that true. as a, as a, I as a driver. The way that manifests today is increased interest in, in, yes. in the cosmos among all. And what goes on in the universe. Yeah. And it also has, our, you know, there's an origin story in there. There's how it mm -hmm. all ends. Mm -hmm. The chemist doesn't have the origin story mm -hmm. or the, how it all ends. Or how it all began, yeah, right. necessarily. Right, that's the origin yeah. story. Right, right, I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's pivot completely mm -hmm. and um, talk about race. You have a chapter in your book uh, about about race and... Color and race. Yes. Color and race, yes. Yeah. Um, Which follows the chapter on gender and identity. Yes, we yeah. could talk about both. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's, let's start with color and race. Um, what, what moved you to want to talk about this topic? What did you, what did you want to say, um, in this chapter? Yeah, I wanted to highlight, um, I want to explore the biases people bring to their lives. Mm -hmm. Some are just sort of in group, out group that may be ingrained within us mm -hmm. evolutionarily. So I want to be sensitive to that. The urge to say, are you with me or are you against me? Uh, I don't think that's necessarily learned. It could just be urges that we have just being human. Mm -hmm. So uh, now, well, what constitutes in-group, out-group? And then you just look at the history of it. Well, it used to be, are you from this country or that country? I'm going to fight you or I'm not. And that actually changed to... Well, it's not which country you are, it's what your skin color is that I'm going to cite. Mm -hmm. And skin color crosses national boundaries. So then the concept of race becomes a, an organizing principle of how people think about other people. Mm -hmm. And so that I'm fascinated that this was the path. I'm also fascinated that whoever does this sort of thing, and it's not just race, anyone typically who classifies people, does so not just to see and celebrate the differences, but to rank people, to rank them by some metric. And this is the difference between recognizing that everyone is different and then deciding that you're better because you're different. That's, that's, that's what I address mm. in that chapter. And... Um, and then I look at <laughs> what is cited as evidence for, especially from 19th century anthropologists, which is arguably the most racist branch of science embedded in a time mm -hmm. that there ever was before or since. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, they go around the world and they see people are different and then they find out and they pass judgment that it's saying that they're inferior, whatever. Okay. So um, growing up as black man in America, I experience people's attitudes towards me and how they pass judgment without even knowing me, how they, uh, <laughs> I'll just give an example. I'm a freshman in college and I'm eating at a local breakfast place and there were two of us eating, and the bill came. They gave one bill to the table, and it was an odd number of cents, okay, in the, mm -hmm. in the pennies column. And that can't be if you have two people, mm -hmm. okay? So we ordered the same thing, mm -hmm. okay? So twice any number is an even number. Mm -hmm. Twice an even number is even number, twice an odd number is even number. So we have two of these. It can't be odd unless there was some rounding going on, okay? Mm -hmm. So I looked at it and I said, okay, had they given us two separate checks, the sum would be one penny less 
than them adding, because you, you have to, the tax is a, is a factor that leaves you with fractions of pennies that require a rounding error, okay? Mm-hmm. So I get that, and I understand that. So I said to the server, can you make this two separate checks, please? And to save one cent. To sa- save one cent, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a principle, it was a matter of principle. Okay, make this two separate checks. Plus, I'm a stu- I'm, I don't have any money. I'm a student, right? Pennies matter. Mm. So they said, uh, no, I can't do that. You have to do that up at the cash register. I said, okay. So I get up to the cash register. I'm a black man now, age 18, in a place where they're black people are not common. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I said, I'd like to pay this as two separate checks. Uh, it will come out less if you do that. They say, uh, no, it won't. This is, the, it's the math. I, and I said, if you do this, it will come out one penny less if you charge them separately. And the, then the guy gets on the microphone at the cash register. Uh, uh, the guy, can you come up here? We have, we have a problem at the cash register. Okay. A problem. So then the manager comes out. So what's the problem? And meanwhile, I'm holding up the line because mm. you don't pay at the table. You pay at the, at the front. There's a long story to make a quick point mm. that while we're going through this, as petty as it was for me to do this, the person behind me in line murmurs to the person he's with, referencing my, this dust up, as, and he says, he obviously doesn't know the distributor property of multiplication. Ooh, said, he fuck with the wrong person. Well, said, well, it was like, wow. You just mess with the wrong black man. Wow. So what that told me was they don't have any idea at what level I'm having this conversation with the cash register. They have no idea. And they're assuming I'm an idiot. Mm-hmm. So I spent my life people assu- with people assuming I'm an idiot. Wait, why, why would it be multiplication rather than addition? No, because it's you. you it's I mean, I'm an one idiot. factor that's distributed across ah, two I see, terms. I see. It's yeah. a, a multiplicative factor across two terms. Got it. And so, um, so I. So you felt underestimated <clears throat> your I'm, whole no, life. No, yeah, the whole my whole life. Oh, of course. Oh yeah, just as as black male. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I was at a wedding. A wedding, okay? I was called a white wedding. <laughs> Just everybody there is white, okay? Mm-hmm. And I'm the only black person there. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, my wife's father. It was a family in-law's wedding. My wife's father is a physicist, mm-hmm. okay? He knows me. We know each other. Uh, someone paid to have a, a, a crop duster drop popcorn on the yard, mm. which I thought was cute, okay? Uh in the reception, the wedding reception. And I'm just wondering, uh, popcorn. Um, <laughs> so when you release the popcorn, I just wondered <laughs> if the propeller, w- how far backwards from the plane it would send it before the, I'm just thinking this out loud, right? And then I'm, I'm, just ask, I'm having this conversation with someone and, Somebody overhears that and comes up to me, doesn't know me, and says, um, oh, you got it all wrong. It's the blah, 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 <laughs> And I said, oh, no, because I was considering the backdraft of the engine mm-hmm. on this mm-hmm. the, in the trajectory of the corn, knowing that it would achieve terminal velocity instantly mm-hmm. because it's very low density. Mm-hmm. I, I say this. and But the guy is sure that I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, mm-hmm. Okay. My wife's father, overhearing this, comes up to me and says, um, <laughs> O'Neill, are you still teaching astrophysics at Princeton? <laughs> <laughs> he just calmly says that. Mm-hmm. Okay, I was, I was finishing a postdoc there and entering, becoming part of the teaching faculty. Then uh-huh. the guy overhears <laughs> this. And then he was no longer, let me help this ignorant person. Mm-hmm. Then he turned it into a conversation Mm -hmm. about the aerodynamics of floating popcorn. Mm -hmm. And his entire attitude changed upon learning this Mm -hmm. relative to his assumptions. I could give hundreds of these examples. Mm -hmm. My point is, this is having lived this, I say, well, what's behind this? 
Do they, that must they believe that they are superior to someone else in whatever way, especially intellectually? Must, do they need this for their survival? What, what's going on here? That chapter is an exploration in mm. that zone. So interestingly, especially that second example, I think if something like that were to happen to me, and it's actually, it, it happens quite often. My first thought would ne- wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily be he's doing this because I'm black. I would I would think he's doing this because he has Dunning Krugers and he like thinks he like there's a lot of just like ego in the world, especially among men and, and like overconfidence where people will just put their foot down and claim to know shit that they just do not know. You're in another time where you have the luxury to think that. Um yeah. my stories come <sighs> from a time where no, I agree. It's a very that, different time. That includes both of these stories are from decades, many decades ago. Yeah, uh, the the pop the first one story was from the nineties, uh-huh, um, uh-huh. but that's now twenty five years ago. Right. So, so, uh, and it's happened less. You know, I have metrics mm. for mm. the reduction in this, which mm-hmm. is why there is no time in the past I'd rather visit. Right. All right. Me too. Okay. No, anyone of color, anyone on the gender spectrum, the women. There is no time in the past where you can honestly say, I was better off, the world was better off for this community back then, let's go back. Mm -hmm. No, no. However slow and circuitous the arc of progress is or has been, it does indeed bend towards justice, Mm -hmm. ultimately. And so this is not an edict, this is an observation Mm -hmm. uh, over time. And so... um, Yes, and there are fits and starts in there, but overall, I think that's an accurate statement. Um, it's these stories mixed in with other stories. For example, when I was a kid, uh, I was into time keeping, time devices, wristwatches that were had complicated dials on it, and and pre digital watch. You know, there was like did have a day and a date or the year or a tachometer. Or, so I had I, so I had a watch. I bought a watch from Macy's with some money I'd saved up. And then the sweep secondhand had fallen off. So I go to my local jeweler. Mm. And I so I need to have this return. And I am 15, black kid, <clears throat> okay? And I walk into the jeweler. And he looks at it, looks at me and says, uh, no, I don't have the key to the back of this to open it. I said, How's, he's a jeweler, uh, why is that so? And I said, oh, okay. But then he said, Plus, this is stolen. And here I am, again, I don't see myself as a black person. I see myself as a scientist. As a kid, I was very sciencey as a kid. Mm-hmm. And then I have to realize, oh, when I step outside, everyone sees me as, the, as a black person. Mm-hmm. And they're interacting with me that way. Mm-hmm. And so there I am thinking, wow, I wonder how Macy's could have obtained stolen watches and how he would know that Macy's obtained or still. And I'm working through this on the assumption that I'm just another person walking into the jewelry store. Mm-hmm. And then I realize, oh, I'm black, he's white, he thinks I'm a criminal, and he accuses me of stealing it. Mm-hmm. That's why he doesn't want to take possession of it to fix it, because mm-hmm. then he'd be in possession of stolen goods, mm-hmm. okay? To the extent that that does not happen to you, you have the luxury of thinking, oh, they're treating me this way just because they're an asshole, not because they, they're they white and I'm black. And that's fine. I'm telling you that some percentage of those cases, if not 100% of them, you have misread. No, that's Based on fair. my life experience as a black man in America. I would, uh, the one thing I would say is I've had... I think way fewer experiences like that, but not none. Thankfully, yes. Because we grew up in different times. I think. Different times. Or well, let me um, add, I probably outweigh you by 130 pounds that too, or so. That too. So I'm a larger person. Back then, yeah. I was very physically fit. Uh-huh. So who am I if I'm a black person? Oh, you must be an athlete. Okay. Right. In my early days, this is <laughs> uh, early days of my public visibility. So let's go back to the 90s. People would recognize me, but wouldn't know where. Right. Well, were you at a conference? We did you? Did I know you? Did we meet? Okay, and then it would move on. I'd seen you on TV. Are, are you a, a sportscaster? All right. Mm-hmm. Their first thoughts is athletics. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, granted, I was physically fit, 
but their first thought was athletics, even though the only times they ever actually saw me was commenting on the universe. Mm -hmm. These are the biases that are deep within our culture. Mm -hmm. And so I address those. I just bring a scientific lens to it. Right. And, and I talk about things they listed for why black people were inferior to white people. And by inferior, they meant closer to apes because the evolutionary, you know, Yeah, you tree. have a hilarious section of your book where you turn this on its head and you inhabit what a black supremacist scientist in the 19th century might cite as evidence equally compelling or uncompelling evidence for <laughs> the supremacy of, of black people. So maybe list some of it. It's kind yeah, of like, yeah. it's kind of a funny exercise to reverse this. Yeah. What I did was I said, suppose the, there were black anthropologists in the 19th century and they were just as racist as the white anthropologist. What would they come up with as evidence that white people were closer to apes than black people? And I just made a whole list just, and it's a, it was a, 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 it's one of my proudest sections of the book because it's it, very clever and it's, it's very, but it's making a serious point, which is that these scientists, they had all of these things that seemed like good evidence of white superiority, but you could find equally compelling evidence of the reverse. They so had say. to sweep under the rug right. and not notice because their bias prevented it. Right. So they little, weren't looking for it. They weren't looking for it. Correct. Right. Little things like, um, Chimpanzees, who are our closest genetic relative, are, are, they're hairy, as are all the great apes. And the hairiest people you have ever seen on this planet have been white people, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> With hair on their chest, you know, especially white men, hair growing up their neck, coming out of their shirt collars. They're white people, mm -hmm. okay? If you really wanted to say white people were closer to apes, start with that. Mm -hmm. They have White people have hair all over the body, just like chimpanzees, mm -hmm. okay? Um, also, aside from the palms of the hands and the face, uh, for uh, many, if not most chimpanzees, if you part the hair, the skin under the hair is pure white. It's not any shade of brown. So they have white skin, like white people. Mm -hmm. But you can keep going. Um, chimpanzees, chimpanzees have really big ears. Mm -hmm. The biggest ears you will have ever seen on any human being are on white people. Is that true? Yeah, well, well, sorry. So the, the way I put it is, I've yeah. been ear watching for decades, and this is my conclusion. But <laughs> I didn't go with a caliper up to ears. Just I, I invite you to make the observation. Ear watching is just never something I, I, I think I look to at do. ears all the time. I well, trust you. I trust well, you. Yeah, it's yeah, just, just to, never something I've registered. But right, right. So, so now start looking at ears. <laughs> oh, you will see the at smallest ears, ears you'll see will be on. And of course, there's overlap. Uh -huh. But and you might cite. Wait a minute, how about Obama? He had big ears. Right. Well, Obama was exactly half European white. Yeah. Exactly well, well, half. Well, we should talk about and, this. But we call him black. We right? do. But he's exactly and half this is white. A, this is a so point maybe that's where he got his biggest big This is a point you and, you and I have both made, I think, many times is we, um, you know, these, these, the way these categories manifest in our society today black, white, Hispanic, Asian, et cetera, there is a social and political history to how these categories came to be that has little, if anything, to do with deep scientific concepts. Um, and we take for granted that Obama was the quote unquote first black president. On what basis was he black rather than mixed race or rather than, rather than white? It's pretty much an arbitrary fact of how we categorize things today. And it'll be different in a hundred years. And it was different a hundred years ago. It's logically no different to call him white yeah. than it is to call him black. Right. Right. Um, and, but people don't really take that to its conclusion. People, I think many people might, they would agree in the abstract with this point, but go around acting as if race is this very real, very important thing. And one point that I've, made and, and that is compelling to me is if you believe race is a, is a social construct, which I do, that suggests you should take the rules and norms around it less and less seriously, right? The hallmark of believing something is socially constructed is to not be as obsessed with it, right? Um, what I've seen in our culture over the past 10 years is people getting more and more obsessed with it, right? Right. Well, oh, you're 
a white person, so you can't open a Mexican restaurant in Portland and we're going to publish an article about how that's not okay. Uh, people of this race can say this particular word, but the, these people can't under any circumstance, even if you're alone rapping to you, like saying your favorite. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, people have been taking these, these rules more and more seriously in my observation over roughly the past 10 years. And I think if we are to really live by the idea that race is a social construct, we should be slowly relaxing our attachment to these social rules of race that we create. Yeah, I agree. But I think you can't fully say that without recognizing the causes of it. And the causes of it were that people were continuing to pass judgment on people because of this uh, race, ethnicity, identity. So, so it's, it's, it's almost a, a, uh, a defense of, okay. Um, you were, you were a Mexican and you ignored me you ignore everything I did and you degra- denigrated me and you're de- okay. Oh, now you want to take my culture and make money off of it. Get the, f- get the fuck out of here. No. Okay, it's a response. It didn't come out of nowhere. Those attitudes and those feelings are in defense of a culture that was previously rejected, but now is being absorbed by people who are then exploiting it. And so I think the the hard edge on that will soften in the coming years because it's a rearing of, a, of, an, of anger, really. I think that's how I view it. That I think will soften, <laughs> and I and we will emerge on the other side of that with respect for all cultures and all all traditions and and all of this. And then you might be happy that someone wants to imitate your imitation is the greatest form of flattery. Mm. You'll be imitating it, but by you imitating it, you're not simultaneously saying that what I was was lesser than you, and now you make a million dollars doing what I was doing from before. By the way, this goes back to uh, the 1970s, late 70s. When did the movie 10 come out? I don't know that Okay, uh, that has Bo Derek, and uh, she's a, a, a fashion model at the mm. time, and white, and she's a 10. Mm-hmm. The whole movie is about a guy's obsession with her uh, as a 10. I see. Okay? An, uh, on an attractiveness scale. Mm-hmm. Uh, the poster of her has her with, with braids coming down, like the kind you get on the beach in the Caribbean. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay? Yeah. And at the time, if you're black and you had that hairstyle, you couldn't go into the workplace. They say you can't do that with your hair. Do something else. It was cornrowed hair down that came off the off the head, mm-hmm. and it dangled. Mm-hmm. Very attractive mm-hmm. uh, on her and on and people who wear this. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden, everyone say, "Oh, look at this new hairstyle of Bo Derek!" And now it's a it's a runaway success movie, mm-hmm. and it was completely taken. All right, without any real respect given to its origins, and so this is blind. It's blind and, and unfair in what would otherwise be um, a society that recognizes the diversity of who's there. So once you see the, the origin of the anger, I think it's more understandable that it is, it is emerging that way, percolating that way in, in, our, in our culture. Well, by the way, it, you know, so, so I totally agree with everything you just said, and uh-huh. especially examples like that where that the thing is actually still largely denigrated in society. And then now it's high fashion, but if you were to wear it on the street, you would get like pulled over like that, that those examples, right. I really agree with. Right. Right. But there are these, I mean, so for instance, Oh, oh, oh one other thing, a yeah, quick one. Yeah. Uh, black people have famously larger lips than white people. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thicker lips. Mm-hmm. Um, have you ever looked at the lips of a chimpanzee? Are they thin? They're really thin. They're <laughs> hardly any lips at all. <laughs> hardly any. So that you can look at a chimpanzee and think black person when mm-hmm. they have large ears and thin lips. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's an extraordinary 
exercise and bias. And then uh, that's the case. And I I say this only because if you're going to make fun of large lips historically, Mm -hmm. and then today there's all these collagen injections into lips Mm -hmm. to make small lips larger, Mm -hmm. now you want the lips. Mm -hmm. Right? That's just a little weird. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's interesting how that happens historically. Yeah, yeah. Things ebb and flow and. Yeah. And so, by the way, I don't mind any of it, provided you don't rank people because of it. Right. That's all. You're going to say you're better than someone because of one feature or another. That's where the problems arise. Mm -hmm. If you're just different, oh, that's interesting. It's different. Yeah. Yeah. So, So there are those really hardcore cases of cultural appropriation where, like we've talked about with the, with, um, the movie 10 and so forth. That's, that's like one class of case in my mind where I agree with the outrage. Um, then there's this other class of cases. Let's just show you it's been going on that long. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So there's other class of cases where, so I had Meg Smaker on this show uh, a couple months ago. Meg Smaker is a woman, happens to be a white American woman. When 9-11 happened, she got on a plane, went to Afghanistan, spent years in the Middle East, learned Arabic fluently, developed all kinds of contacts there. And in the mid-2010s, got access to a program where former jihadis that had spent 15 years in solitary in, in, in Guantanamo Bay went to Saudi Arabia and did a rehab rehabilitation program, like a really nice rehabilitation program in Saudi Arabia, um, and reintegrated back into society. Somehow she got access to befriend and film them at this rehab. So again, we're talking about spend, she she spent years and years in the Middle East learning Arabic, um, and legitimately befriends these men and gets permission to do this amazing documentary showing them in all their complexity, not just as terrorists, but as human beings. Anyway, makes this brilliant documentary, goes to Sundance. She gets like a standing ovation. And then some people attack her because she's white. And then they take the movie out of Sundance. And now you can't even see it all because she happens to be the wrong color, despite having all the legitimate... Uh, d- despite it being so clear that she was not denigrating or stealing a- a- in in any um, in any kind of way that is similar to these other cases, and yet still, it just doesn't matter. I think that force of resistance will soften. Yeah, I hope it does. Based on my read of of the arc of conduct in culture, uh-huh. and uh, consider, for example. Um, I grew up in an era where there were no black performers on Broadway, Mm -hmm. but how do they get a job? You can make a musical that was an all black cast. Mm. So for a period of years, not many, but a period of years, it was all black cast. My first Hello Dolly was with Pearl Bailey in an all black cast. Mm. Same story with a little bit of sort of soul, you know, soul flavoring to Mm it. Uh, And I remember thinking, well, why are they all black cast? Just, I'm young, so I'm naive. And then I learned, oh, there were no opportunities. The others were not <laughs> advertised as all white cast. That's just what they were, mm-hmm. right? They weren't even ever looking for a black person because they were going to cast a black person. It has to be because they needed a black person in the plot line, not because you're just an actor right. who wants to perform. So this was an important transitionary period there. By the way, if cinema went through that earlier, Mm-hmm. Okay. If you were a black person in a movie, it's because you were the black person or you were the, the bellhop or you were the Pullman Porter. Mm-hmm. It's not because you were just another actor with nuanced character uh, uh, elements in your, uh, it, it, in the development of who you were. So, so, um, so then you have all black films and then you have the cross pollination and now you see black actors in films and it's not even a newsworthy thing. They're just another yeah, like Actor think of uh, John David Washington in Tenet, Christopher Nolan's last last movie. It's like the protagonist is just a black actor, yeah. but it's completely irrelevant that he's black. Correct. It's, it could have been Here's, anyone, and he's just awesome. Correct. And that's it's. I think that's a true sign of progress when that can happen, and no one thinks it's weird. Correct, correct. And again, I'm old enough when Doug Williams started as quarterback in the Super Bowl. This is in the 1990s. Mm-hmm. First black quarterback in the Super Bowl. There were articles. Uh, can a black person should this? You know, 
the quarterback, that's the smartest position on the field. <laughs> yeah. And that's why there haven't been black quarterbacks, because they have lower IQ. Mm -hmm. And so that's why. And then he set a Super Bowl record for mm -hmm. passing. Uh, and so that, boom, now there are black players and you're not, it's not a thing. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, we have to crawl before we can walk and walk before we can run. And I think, like I said, this resistance, I think will, it'll soften. I, I, I don't see that people can have the energy to sustain that. Mm. But it's a reminder that, yeah, you were the oppressor. Mm -hmm. I can't have you claiming that you're, you know, you're my friend now. Mm. So you, you, have to, you, you have to earn um, it a little more, I think. Um, so last question. Um, in, in your book, on, in the race chapter, you... Oh, but one of the last points of comparison mm. between white people saying black people are Neanderthal closer to... Neanderthal DNA? To, this is oh, my that's favorite. another one. Yeah, I just that's want to give favorite. another one. Okay. The uh, you probably never, ever, ever, ever saw black children look at a tree and say, "I want to live in that tree." <laughs> 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 yeah, tree houses are like a major feature of suburban living right. in the backyard of white children, mm -hmm. and so so you, you get this nineteenth century black racist anthropologist saying, mm -hmm. these are just white people wanting to get returned to their roots <laughs> in the trees. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty, it's a fun sort of stupid list yeah. of comparisons. Just if you want to be racist, and then I, midway the list, I say, look how easy it is to be racist. It is, it is very Let's easy. Let's continue. Oh, yeah. It's very easy mm -hmm. by the standards of, of the 19th century anthropology. Correct. Correct. Which were basically no standards at all. <laughs> right. And then there's Neanderthal DNA, which is only possessed by by basically descendants of Europeans. Right. And that's, of course, an emergent recent discovery. When yeah. I grew up, Neanderthal was like the backwards. For saying someone is dumb. For, yeah. yeah, that, yeah. It, don't be a Neanderthal. Right. right. They were like the dumbest things. Because right. they didn't survive and Cro-Magnon survived. So it was easy to treat them and think of them that way. And if, if that had turned out the other way, that black people had Neanderthal DNA and white people didn't. It would have been a trivial. There would have been, it, in a lot of people's minds, they would have, well, in some people's minds, they would have said, well, of there course. you go. That's part of why black people are dumber. Right. Right, right. But then it would it would also be whatever scientists discover that and publicize that might be tarred as a racist too on the other side when they were just publishing a fact. So it's like there's so many dynamics that are unhealthy and vestiges of the the the, the history of of racism and yeah, and it, also overreactions it's it's also baggage. overreactions to we're it as well. Dragging the baggage behind yeah. us and it's still there. S occasionally, some of it is shed. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still, it's still there, as you know. So the point about the Neanderthal DNA is we now find out that is really exclusively of European. Um, some Europeans have 3% or mm -hmm. low single digit percent mm -hmm. Neanderthal DNA. And we now see research articles say, saying, well, we need to revisit the creativity of Neanderthal. You know, <laughs> they're, too, they're not as dumb as, and all of a sudden the whole set of research papers are coming out Mm -hmm. um, rehabilitating the image of Neanderthals. And you can't help but notice the coincidence mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. with the results that Europeans have Neanderthal DNA. So ultimately, I think we want to get to a place where if people really feel that there is only one race, the human race. That's at least what I want to... I want with all the diversity it contains. Yes. Yeah, you celebrate yeah. it. You don't rank it. But there is a, there are people now that don't like that phrase. The, the, it was in 2015, it's a little old now, but the University of California released a document saying there is only one race, the human race, is a microaggression. Um, in, in Ibram X. Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, he says, there is only one race, the human race. That's an incorrect sentiment, which is bound to fail because it has failed in the past. How do you feel about the What's the my ethos. stance? <laughs> yeah, what is your stance on there is one race, the human race, yeah, as an I, ethos? I use that phrase in the book only because it comes off of everyone thinking of multiple races. Mm -hmm. So it works in that context. Yeah. You want to say the world has six races? No, we're one race. So Because I'm using the same vocabulary. Mm -hmm. But I'd rather just say we're one species and mm -hmm. then we're done. Mm -hmm. So don't say one race. The human race is a phrase, so that's why it's used. Right. If you want to microanalyze that phrase and say that these words affect people, fine, then get rid of it. But 
the, the idea is that we are one. We are homo sapiens, one species. And I don't think you can unpack that in any way that offends anybody. Mm. So, so don't overthink human race. It's proxy for human species. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to talk about here. We're one species, interbreeding single species. That's what we are with all the beautiful variants that exist within it. On that note, Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you so much for coming on All our right, show dude. again. Yeah, keep it going. All right. We, we love your work. We love thank your writings. You. They're nice, uh, they're thought-provoking. Um, uh, people get angry <laughs> with when we read some of your stuff, mm -hmm. but they, they, at the, they still have to respect it because yeah. your arguments are tight. Yeah. Or at least they're, um, they don't so much come from an emotional place, they come from an academic place. Mm. And that always uh, forces a higher level of attention. It, it commands a higher level of attention. I do people my best. just screaming, yeah. running up and down the street. I try to. I try okay. to. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. All right. That's it for this episode of Conversations with Coleman, guys. As always, thanks for watching. And feel free to tell me what you think by reviewing the podcast, commenting on social media, or sending me an email. To check out my other social media platforms, click the cards you see on screen. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.